tonight on the Donlin Report, actor Alec Baldwin accidentally shoots two people on set, leaving one dead. And now new reporting that the prop gun misfired several times over the last week. I'll speak with a stunt scientist about how this could have happened. The FDA authorizes booster shots for Johnson & Johnson and Moderna, while a new Pfizer study shows 90% efficacy in children ages 5 to 11. But one doctor says the spike this winter could be worse than expected. I'll ask him why. And the empty shelf crisis hits the little guy. I'll talk with one toy store owner who is shutting his doors tomorrow because he can't keep inventory. Is it time to do your holiday shopping right now? I'm Rudy Bey Shabazi. Joe will be back on Monday. The Donlin Report starts right now. They say truth is stranger than fiction. And sometimes a story is so bizarre and unbelievable, it catches the attention of the country, particularly when a Hollywood celebrity kills someone. That is the pulse of America tonight. You know Alec Baldwin from his Emmy award-winning role on 30 Rock. His Emmy-winning portrayal of President Trump on SNL and countless other movies spanning decades. But what happened on set yesterday changed his life in a way no role ever could. By now, you've probably heard about the tragedy in New Mexico. Baldwin firing a gun while filming a scene, accidentally killing his cinematographer, Helena Hutchins, and injuring his director, Joel Sousa. Here's the 911 call from the set. Uh, Bonanza Creek Ranch has had two people accidentally shot on a movie set by a prop gun. We need help immediately. Okay. Bonanza Creek Ranch, come on. Hey. Director and our cameraman, the cameraman has been shot. The LA Times now reporting crew members walked off the set hours before the deadly shooting in protest of working conditions and that a prop gun had misfired three times over the past week. And by now you're probably wondering how could this possibly happen? What's even more unbelievable is this is not the first time this has happened on a set. Baldwin himself distraught after the incident, reportedly saying over and over again, how could you hand me a hot gun? Remember Brandon Lee, the son of martial arts star Bruce Lee, died during a filming of The Crow in 1993. He was shot with a stray bullet from a gun that was just supposed to have blanks. And before that, in 1984, John Eric Hexum shot himself on the set of a TV series called Cover Up when playing with a firearm and pulling the trigger after aiming it at his head. Tonight, a team simply doing what they loved, working together to make movie magic, are now the subjects of an investigation and mourning their friend and colleague. And that's where we begin tonight with News Nation's Nancy Liu in Los Angeles. Nancy, what's the latest tonight? Well, Ruta Bay, there is high interest in this investigation because the tragedy has shaken the entire entertainment industry with a lot of people people questioning how and why could it happen. In a statement today, the Santa Fe District Attorney said, the investigation is in its preliminary stages, so it's not known yet whether any charges will be filed. But authorities have confirmed that the shooting involved a prop gun and that Alec Baldwin fired the fatal shot. A live round killed 42-year-old director of photography, Helena Hutchins, and injured 48 year old director Joel Souza. In a series of tweets today, Baldwin said, there are no words to convey my shock and sadness regarding the tragic accident that took the life of Helena Hutchins, a wife, mother, and deeply admired colleague of ours. I'm fully cooperating with the police investigation to address how this tragedy occurred, and I am in touch with her husband, offering my support to him and his family. My heart is broken for her husband, their son, and all who knew and loved Helena. Now, the sheriff's department has not yet revealed what kind of gun was involved in this incident and what it was loaded with. Rita Bay. Nancy, it is so tragic all around, and the family of Brandon Lee also releasing a statement tonight. Yeah, absolutely. As you mentioned earlier, Brandon Lee killed in 1993 on the set of The Crow. His sister issuing a statement which said, our hearts go out to the family of Helena Hutchins and to Joel Souza and all involved in the incident on Rust. No one should ever be killed by a gun on a film set, period. Rudy Bay. 
Nancy in Los Angeles for us. Thank you very much for that reporting. And I want to bring in now two people who have firsthand knowledge about the inner workings of a movie set. Steve Wolf is a movie prop scientist and theatrical firearm safety expert. And Laura Pellegrini is a film director for New York-based Rosso Films International. Thank you both for joining us tonight. And Steve, I want to start with you. Why are guns that are capable of killing people still being used on movie sets? Why is there still stupidity? I don't know. You know, there's no reason to bring a gun that is capable of firing live ammo onto a movie set unless it's for the purpose of protecting the crew. If you're shooting in a bad neighborhood, you bring live guns. Otherwise, you hand actors guns that have been modified so that they cannot shoot live ammunition. The modification, it, given that this was a, a, an old Western piece, I'm going to presume it was a revolver, but you can weld the inside of the cylinders here to ensure that live ammo cannot be placed in them and that bullets can't fit through. You can modify the inside of the, the barrel here so that only smoke, fire, and noise can come out. So it's absolutely possible to hand an actor a gun that they can't shoot somebody with. Why that was not done, I don't know. And why there could have been live ammo in that gun, I don't know. And third thing, why would you point a gun at someone unless you want to shoot them? There's no excuse for that. This is one of the basic rules of gun safety. Don't point things at guns. Don't point guns at things you don't want to see holes in. So you have to break several rules in order to create an onset fatality, not just one. And it's true, obviously, that gun, the amp, live ammo is never supposed to be brought onto a set, but that's a recommendation, not a law, right? And even a blank cartridge shot at close range can seriously injure someone, as in the case of, of John Eric Hexum in 1984. John Eric Hexum pointed a blank gun at his head, pressed the trigger, the hot discharge pressure pushed his brain, his skull into his brain. So, yeah, adding, ma making it a law is not going to change it. People break the law and do stupid things that get people killed all the time. Uh, hiring people who know what they're doing, that would be a big plus. All right, Laura, I want to turn to you now. Does this make you think twice about using guns or any kind of weapons in your work? It's definitely a valid question. Um, Stefano Defray, my filmmaking partner and I, we, we've done a lot of films where we've had to um, deal with different types of pis uh, pistols and rifles on set. And um, across the board, we've had to have conversations with multiple departments, obviously working closely alongside with the prop master to make sure that we have safety protocols on set so that you're not pointing a gun at someone. Um, it's a good question. It's, it's still very early on in the investigation about exactly what happened, but it's definitely a reminder that, you know, there are ways to work around it as well. There's also discussion about, you know, maybe resorting to post-production methods to incorporate the use of guns, which can be tricky if you're trying to capture a certain environment that is gritty, right? If you're working on a World War II set, how do you work around not having guns on set? But at the end of the day, the most um, imperative thing is that there needs to be that reinforcement on set, working alongside closely with the director and the props master to put those safety cr protocols in place. And Steve, to you, what exactly is the process when a gun is used on set? What kinds of regulation and or testing is required? So typically one would want to demonstrate the firearm for the crew, ask everyone on the crew if they have any questions or concerns, show the crew members, this is a prop gun, it has been modified, welds have been put in here to keep live ammo from going into it. These are the rounds that I'm planning to use. These are blank rounds, anyone is welcome to look at them. This is the barrel of the gun. Because we, don't want, we want to make sure that unlike in the Brandon Lee case, we don't have a blank pushing a projectile down the gun. We'll give everyone a chance to inspect the gun. And then once, you know, any questions have been asked and answered, then we can proceed. Then we tell the actor, okay, this is the gun. Here are the modifications. This is the blank ammo that you're going to be using. That card that we put up on the wall there, that's what you're going to aim at. You're going to point the gun. When you're told to, you're going to press the trigger. The blank will fire. You then lower the gun and I will come take it from you. I'll put it back where it's safe and nobody will get hurt. None of these things were done. Obviously, if you had a gun that shot something, it was capable of shooting. It was capable of shooting and something came out, something was put into it that shouldn't have been. And none of the modifications or safety procedures were followed. 
an so elephant. They, they, they broke all the rules, and that this death is unfortunately the, the result. Sorry to interrupt you there, Alec Baldwin himself asking that question, according to reporting. So, Laura, obviously there are a lot of safety measures. There are union protocols in place in California. Is is New Mexico more lax than California on set? Well, I think, you know, obviously this situation is a wake up call and um, it, it should be following similar protocol to California. If in fact, those rules are more strident and are more, um, you know, concerned about taking precautions, then certainly a situation like this would be a powerful wake up call. And I hope that New Mexico can can learn from this situation and again, effectively put that protocol in place. And, and what do you make of the reporting by the LA Times that crew members were walking off the set the day of the shooting, protesting safety measures on that set? I think, you know, obviously when a tragedy of that nature happens on set, people are rattled, rattled. their morale is very, very low. Um, they're still asking a lot of questions. They themselves can't necessarily process what's happening. It's something that, you know, everyone grieves in their own way. And on set, you need solidarity. You know, you need to carry each other forward. But when something like this happens, it's, it's really hard to maintain that perspective. So I think people are still caught up in the maelstrom of high emotions, high tension and uncertainty about safety on set. And I, I, I want to add, though, that you know, no, no amount of safety meetings will stop bullets. What stops people from getting shot are re retro engineering the physics by which one could get shot. By not pointing a gun at someone, they can't get shot. By not having live ammo in the gun, they can't get shot. By not having a gun capable of firing, they can't get shot. Low, low morale happens, you know, and it sucks to work on a movie and your paycheck is late and you have to drive 50 miles from you know, Albuquerque instead of staying nearby. These things aren't fun, but they're not the cause of a fatal accident. They're, they're just what happens when you get into low budget filmmaking. So in your opinion, new safety measures, new protocols, new procedures would not be in order because they simply weren't following the current ones? Do you not see any change the, 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 the coming from this? One, yeah, the current safety protocols that are widely used are sufficient. And prop guns are used on movie sets, you know, hundreds of times a week all over the world without anyone getting shot. It's when you break the rules, when you don't follow the safety protocols, when you have people doing the work for you who don't know what they're doing, this is when you get in the problem. All right, well, we're gonna to have to leave it there. We appreciate the insight from both of you, Steve Wolf and Laura Pellegrini. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. The empty shelf crisis hits the little guy. I'll talk with one toy store owner who is shutting his doors tomorrow because he can't keep inventory. A new Pfizer study shows 90% efficacy in children ages 5 to 11, and the FDA approves Moderna and Johnson & Johnson booster shots. So why is one doctor warning of a winter spike? I'll ask him. And don't forget to follow us on social media at The Donlin Report on Twitter. Mom and pop businesses, the backbone of America, the land of opportunity, are getting hammered during the supply chain crisis. You can't sell what you can't get. Meantime, prices are also rising. Small business owners reporting the highest price increases since 1971. And economists say this crisis will likely stretch into next year and beyond. So who's best equipped to survive this supply crunch? The big guys, Amazon, Walmart, and other big corporations who can afford space on cargo ships rent their own cargo ships, and go to other suppliers for their products. So what does this all mean for you? Well, according to Jay Foreman, CEO of toy manufacturer Basic Fun, your holidays may be basic, and shopping for them may be not so fun. Foreman's company, among others, among other things, makes Care Bears and My Little Pony, if you're into putting a little nostalgia under your tree. He says the toy your child wants might be as much as 400% more expensive this year. But more important than the things we want are the things we need. And that's also costing more. Compared to a year ago, regular unleaded gas is up 56%. The national average is 3.37 a gallon. Meat up 13%. And big appliances like washing machines and dryers up 19%. But in the end, that little store around the corner and your neighbor who runs it has no choice but to raise prices on you if they can find products to sell you with no end in sight, and we take it from there. With Aliyah Lefferts from JoJo's Toys in Newington, Connecticut, 
His store is about to shut its doors. Welcome to the show. Tell me about your toy store. This must have been a dream for you and why you saw no choice but to shut your doors. Yes, well, thank you for having me. I appreciate being on the show. This was a dream, and honestly, we accomplished what we set out to do. We wanted to be filled with joy and bring love and warmth to the community, and I think we did it. But the problem is the supply chain, the price increase, I mean, three times over for our inventory, and of course, Amazon and online platforms, they're just undercutting the price so badly, and they wouldn't even let us list at a decent price. So it's, it's tough. It strong arms the small business, and this is the price we pay. I'm so sorry to hear about the, the loss of your business. So you're shutting tomorrow, right? What is it like to be? Tomorrow's the last day. What is it like to, to be experiencing your last day there? Um, it's bittersweet because it's been very stressful the past two months with such minimal sales. But, you know, you don't set out to open a business to just shut it down five months after that. So it's very bitter. It's a little sad when I look around and see the shelves beginning to empty. Um, but I think it'll hit me probably more next week. Today and tomorrow are going to be busy. And, and it is so tough to open a business and have it survive in the best of times. And you opened it in the middle of COVID. Why, why were you so optimistic about it? Yeah, you know, I appreciate that question. So when I first got laid off from my job prior to this, had about six months of sitting around and during that time something shifted for me and it happened to a lot of my friends where we decided why are we going to keep working for everybody else let's do what we really wanted to do and so my wife said let's open a toy store and the idea made sense so in september last year we wrote a plan we got it together we were going to open in los angeles but the um, occupancy was so low and I grew up in Connecticut. I said, let's go to Connecticut. There's families out there. It's a good environment, the communities, which is exactly what we have. This community in Newington is phenomenal. Wonderful people and loving people, but it just wasn't enough. So we thought we could bring that magical element of a toy store that you don't have at the big box stores, where nobody's even in the same aisle to help you. Here we know everybody's name. I know all the people, their names are on the wall from painting their stuff on arts and crafts in the back wall. We made a loving place, but you know, the, the price increase was the nail in the coffin, honestly, and the supply chain delay. And toy stores are s such a magical, fun place to be. Um, I wanted to talk to you in terms of the perspective of the consumer too, because we've been hearing about this holiday crunch, so we wanted to go straight to the source. What can families expect to be paying for toys and will they be available this holiday season? Great question. Now, I certainly don't have a crystal ball, but from my experience, our cost increase went up three times, 300% increase. That being the case, I'd say prices are at least going to double, at least, because to stay in business, you have to do a markup, usually a, a full markup. So. If you can imagine our prices tripling in order to you know, keep us sustained as a family and have the business pay for itself. So I could be wrong and listen, I hope I am, but prices are going to skyrocket, I believe. And I mean, what can we do? That's the nature of what's happening. So the, the oh, and as far as the delays, yeah, it's about 75 days on average to get product, and that's actually rising. Um, I have product we ordered in June. I received an email today. They're going to ship it on November 17th, and this is the email after the October shipment date email. September date, you see what I'm doing. So I don't think we'll ever see that product. We certainly won't be in business anymore, so too bad for them. So what is your plan now? Well, we look for work. Who would have thought? I told my wife, I guess I don't need my resume anymore, and all of a sudden I have to dust it off. But that's okay. You know, that's what we do. You know, we, we know where we stand. We know who's behind us. You know, no, no one else has to be when I say this. Please don't get me wrong, but we are people of faith. So we know God is in control, and we know he's going to keep us afloat through this. And we know we did what we needed to do. We're proud of it. It's a charming place, and I think it would have worked. Maybe in a year and a half or two years, we'll have a better sense of 
where we stand economically and kind of the new trend. That's just my belief. So maybe at that time, maybe you'll see JoJo's Toys and More again. Well, we hope to check back in with you and, and uh, tell a different story from here on out. We appreciate your time tonight, and I'm very sorry for the loss of your store. Aliyah Lefferts, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you. Good night. Good night. And we are covering the supply chain crisis from every angle. Just heard from the toy store owner. He can't stock his shelves. The CEO of one restaurant chain says rising prices are making it harder to feed customers. And truckers are now being offered six figures. But if there's a shortage, why are all these trucks waiting outside the port in an LA neighborhood? That and more tonight on the Dalman Report. We just heard about the toy shortage, and now what about at your favorite restaurant? Those prices are higher too, and in some items, in short supply. For that, we welcome in Paul Mangiamelli. He is the head of Bennigan's and Steak and Ale Restaurants. Welcome to the show. So you've called these supply chain disruptions and rising prices treacherous. That's a strong word. Why? Well, the first part, well, let me say this first. Great to be on the show. And great to see you again because we miss you down here in the in the uh, Miami Fort Lauderdale area. It's good to see you, and I'm and I'm glad I'm glad you're doing so well in in your new gig. Well, thank you. Uh, I appreciate it, that. Oh, absolutely. It's so good to be with you. And uh, why do I call it treacherous? It's because nobody controls it. Uh, it's it's one of those insidious uh, aspects of doing our business, which we have to do in addition to the COVID surges. The draconian mandates that are out there have exacerbated all the issues and obstacles that we have in our business, whether it's the supply chain disruptions or it's the commodities uh, being able to get in the inflation uh, areas uh, and, and, you know, a host of other issues that, uh, as your uh, previous guest said, uh, the toy store owner, my, my heart really went out to him because as an independent owner, which most of our franchisees are, um, but he's all there by himself, and it's part of small business. And small business is the grease of commerce, and it's just not being paid attention to by the, the, this administration. You know, uh, President Biden has asked for leadership, and we're asking him to do just that. Uh, there's a lot of programs that are available through the SBA. Uh, there's a revitalization program for the restaurants. Uh, there's SBA loans. There's a, uh, they, they have an economic in injury disaster loan that takes literally so many months to process the application, but they, by the time they do it, uh, a guy like the toy store owner is out of business. So it's really not helping anybody. And yet, you know, we're, we're, we're suffering through the, the vagaries of all the aspects of trying to bring our great Bennigan's food, steak and ale food, Bennigan's on the fly, and, and try to improvise, adapt, and overcome these obstacles in order to bring uh, the, the, what the guest has experienced for over 50 years that that perfect experience. And so uh, there's some things that we're doing too. I mean, look, uh, uh, we've been around for so long, we have a lot of experience. Part of it is our intellectual capital. Um, I, uh, my senior vice president of operations, Sean Finn, he can't get any more Irish than that. He just celebrated his 34th year with Benigan's. That intellectual capital is, is yeah, priceless when it comes to trying to overcome the obstacles in front of us. People still I'm want to I'm sorry go to out. jump in. I don't mean to interrupt you. I just want to get quickly to specifically sure. the supply chain issue and how that's affected your restaurants. Because I know it's a perfect storm of a labor shortage, the supply chain, COVID, many other things. But when we talk about just the supply chain, how has that affected your restaurants and your customers? Well, as you've already heard, some of the products that we have uh, either you can't get or they're, they're, they're back shipped. Uh, so we've had to come up with a substitute product or uh, adjust the menus themselves and streamline them so that on the product that is available, we prepare it and then serve it to our guests, whether it be in delivery or curbside pickup or inside the dining rooms we're allowed to, we're, we, we are allowed and don't have the restrictions. And so we do it that way. And we also look at the, you know, the utilization of our labor um, on in, in the sense of, are you just open for dinner uh, and uh, for a couple of days out of the week uh, and adjust your, your hours accordingly so you get the maximum optimization of your labor pool as well as addressing the supply chain issues 
that, um, you know, not only from a delivery standpoint, uh, you know, from, from actually receiving the product, um, but there's the, the cost of the product, the inflationary issues that we're addressing right now that, you know, like your previous guest said, we see somewhere to 80 to 100% increases. So of course we're taking uh, moderate increases uh, on our menu. We're not, we're, not, uh, we're not transferring the full weight of the, the issues that we're dealing with right now, uh, and, but still being able to deliver on our promise and utilize the, that intellectual capital that we have and the experience that we have within our teams and our franchise partners that we have around the world uh, to still be able to deliver on that promise. And we talk about how it's affecting a big uh, chain of restaurants, but this is also affecting the poorest Americans who can't afford to eat at restaurants, who are stretching their budget and at the limit just to feed their families. Um, mm -hmm. what, does, what do you feel for them when you think about, you know, you see the effects on a big business like your own? I, I love them because the emotional connections to our brands runs very, very deep and, and over 50 years, as I mentioned. So what I did recently is just sign an agreement with a, a company called Reef Kitchens that's based right here in Miami, and they have over 4,500 delivery vessels. So what we do is we put together a modified menu of what people love to eat. Um, like you see the, the big Irish and our world famous Monte Cristo, old baby back ribs, our flat iron steak sandwich or our Reuben sandwich, uh, our broccoli bites, our, our death by chocolate desserts. And we come up with a delivery program with Reef and others that we're talking to right now to try to get them to those people that can't afford to go to a restaurant, but can get a pro one product delivered to their homes. And we're, so we're trying to distribute that not only inter, uh, uh, domestically, but internationally as well, and doing the best we can to serve the guests that are so loyal to us and have been that way for just, a, just close to 50 years. All right, well, Paul Mangimelli, we appreciate you being here. Thank you so much. You got the name right. You're very welcome. Thank yeah, you so much. Yeah, my good or what? <laughs> thank uh, you. Thank you. Take care. And now to get anything to those Bennigan's restaurants and to toy stores, the products have to get on trucks. And that's the problem. Trucks have been lining the streets near the Port of Los Angeles, much to the chagrin of pretty much everyone. The drivers want to get their trucks loaded and have to wait. Local homeowners want to get them out. And stores want the trucks on the road. So what's going on? Matt Schrapp heads up the Harbor Trucking Association in Los Angeles. Matt, welcome to the show. Good to have you. Explain what's going on here. Well, it is a complicated dance, to say the least. Uh, this, this supply chain has been described as a system of systems. And one of the issues that we have specifically related to marine terminal turns is the inability to return empty containers into these terminals. Many of those trucks that you see, especially in neighborhoods, are pulling away from yards with these empty containers to take back to the terminals when they are able. And a big part of this problem, right, was the miscalculation on the demand side when it came to what American people and companies wanted and were going to order during the pandemic, and then coupled with the crippled ports overseas and then the trucking industry also dealing with COVID. So what is the state of the trucking business right now? Well, drivers want to drive. You know, we are can-do kind of industry. We're ready to move this cargo as soon as we're able. Honestly, the men and women who have been working through the pandemic and through this entire supply chain crisis should be commended. In fact, I don't think they are enough. And so just a shout out to everybody who's working in the supply chain. Thank you. And I think that the American consumer is not to blame necessarily for all this. I don't really think that it. no one had seen this coming. But again, the challenges truly are because we cannot return empty containers back into these marine terminals and the chassis that these containers are sitting on top of are unable to be used elsewhere in the supply chain. So it just goes round and round in a vicious circle. And until we can get these empty containers evacuated out by these ocean carriers, we're just going to be in the same boat, no pun intended. And we definitely all appreciate truckers when we don't have them, right? Truckers move 71% of the country's goods. Um, there was already, though, a shortage before the pandemic. You say these drivers want to drive, but now the American Trucking Association says uh, there is a shortage of 80,000 truckers. Where have they gone and how do we get them back? 
Well, the ATA has always published driver shortage statistics, and those are primarily driven by over the road positions. That's the long haul trucking that you can think of. Uh, here locally, we have over 17,000, you know, 17, 18,000 trucks that are registered to do business in the ports of LA and Long Beach, and also about 13,000 that are considered, you know, frequent callers, where they're here at least one time a day during the week. So locally, we don't see it as a driver shortage issue, it's a productivity issue. Issue. There's so much congestion that they're unable to make the turns so they can get those imports off of the dock. That's really what's driving this. It's not a function of not enough drivers. It's a function of not enough productivity. All right, Matt Schrapp of Harbor Trucking Association, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Thank you very much. Shifting gears a bit here to some better news for, some, uh, for a change. Medical experts are predicting an easier winter this year compared to last year in terms of the pandemic. The key difference, far more Americans are now vaccinated against the virus. Joining me now for more on these predictions is immunologist Dr. Human Norchasm. Uh, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Rudabe. Thanks very much for inviting me. Okay, so more than half the country is now fully vaccinated. Do you agree with the prediction that this winter will be better than last? Well, I certainly hope so. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, people have obviously been vaccinated. Uh, many people, uh, up to about 30% of the country, is still uh, unimmune, unfortunately. And, and this is a combination of folks who have not been vaccinated and have not been infected naturally, as well as people who have been vaccinated but whose vaccines are not optimally immunizing them. So, you know, I think that there are two parameters here that really we should be considering. One is the, the, the fraction of the population that is not uh, currently immune, and that's really the, the the main parameter to be considering in this pandemic immunity not so much vaccination per se and and the second parameter is really that you know this year compared to last the size of the global viral load if you will of this pandemic virus is substantially higher uh, the, by orders of magnitude so a lot more people are going to be susceptible to infection so we don't exactly know where the break-even point is going to be on this uh, but you know we certainly hope that um, fewer folks are going to uh, succumb to the infection uh, I, I really do think that the main parameter actually is uh, the fraction of people who are immune and this immunity is uh, you know actively clinically achieved through vaccination obviously um, as well as uh, assessment of folks who um, are naturally immune and potentially could forego vaccination. But we don't know how long the immunity lasts, right? right? For natural immunity, if you've in fact contracted the virus versus how long it lasts if you get vaccinated. So why, why take the risk? Why not just get vaccinated and urge vaccinations for everyone um, instead of using the option of, well, I've had the virus earlier in the year, so I'm immune? Well, yeah, look, the, uh, the preponderance of epidemiological evidence right now, uh, these are some very large studies out of Israel and, um, and um, the Cleveland Clinic and uh, other uh, places. My colleagues and I just recently actually uh, did a, a large meta-analysis. And uh, the preponderance of evidence is showing that folks who are naturally immune and serologically antibody positive uh, are equally, if not better, uh, more robustly immune than folks who have had uh, vaccinations. Now, both um, of these uh, types of immunity immune uh, responses will have a wane rate and I think we really need to be focused on what the, what, where, where immunity starts to wane. Uh, now, my, my whole point and the discourse, the point of discourse has been that we ought not to uh, put through people through draconian um, uh, mandates and force them to get vaccinated if they already are serologically immune as a result of a natural infection. But there is some data, you're absolutely right, where you could achieve some marginal benefit, and I think if people want to become bulletproof, as, as Dr. Fauci uh, mentions this, uh, they're welcome to do so. Now, one thing that I would be very cautious about is uh, vaccinating people who have been recently infected or recently convalescent. I do think that there's actually danger in doing so if someone is concurrently infected and they get vaccinated or has recently convalesced. So I think we need to be a little bit circumspect about that. I want to switch gears a little bit now. A new study released just today shows the Pfizer vaccine is 90.7% effective for kids ages 5 to 11. Do you recommend the vaccine for children? 
Look, I think this, these vaccines in general are, are highly effective. I mean, these are probably one, some of the most effective vaccines we've ever built. It's not surprising that the results are good in kids. They're very good in adults as well. However, uh, you know, I, uh, as I've mentioned to Joe on this show before, is uh, you know, I think the vaccination of kids who are um, already immune as a result of a natural infection should be a hard stop. Uh, I mean, I, I don't think we should be uh, too cavalier about vaccinating kids who've uh, already had an infection or already immune in particular. And so I think there is room to be circumspect. I, I think it's reasonable for parents to actually consider whether their kid has had um, an, a recent infection or, or is currently immune and to possibly forego that vaccination. I, I don't think that's an unreasonable um, uh, decision to make on the part of a parent. How long does that uh, so last, I, I, though? I, How long does that immunity last? Yeah. You know, I think it's going to last at least as long as um, the um, vaccine immunity would. Uh, we, we already know that IgG antibodies are quite long lasting, somewhere between six to 12 months. So I think if a person is in a, in a decision, at a decision point where they don't want to just go based on these time schedules that the uh, CDC and FDA are recommending, it's feasible to measure the antibody levels if the kid is antibody positive to, to wait and then measure the antibody level again in six months. Again, I think uh, it's very important to, to consider that we, in, in American medicine at least, we do accommodate people and, and I think patient anxiety is, is a large part of how we practice medicine. So there are a lot of parents out there who are quite anxious and appropriately so. I mean, these vaccines are quite reactogenic. I mean, I've had um, kids, um, my, my own kids' friends, who've had this vaccine and have had very high fevers and, and have uh, you know, felt pretty lousy. This is a pretty reactogenic vaccine and I think there's room to be circumspect here. I think we should aim to vaccinate as many people as quickly as possible who are unimmune, but I think there's room uh, for for the United States uh, um, uh, Food and Drug Administration as well as the CDC to be um, circumspect about uh, vaccinating people who are already immune. All right, Dr. Norchasm, thank you for joining us tonight. Have a good weekend. Pleasure. Thanks very much for having me. Brian Laundry has been found dead, bringing the manhunt to a close. What's next in the investigation and what key piece of evidence might finally give us some answers? We'll talk to News Nation's own Brian Etten in Northport, Florida for the very latest. New information tonight from the Laundry family attorney. Brian's remains have been sent to an anthropologist. Joining me now from Northport, Florida, News Nation's Brian Enton. So, Brian, why were the remains sent to an anthropologist? Well, apparently it's going to take quite a bit of work to work on them and come up with a cause of death, if they can even come up with a cause of death. We confirmed that this is basically just skeletal remains, bones, and part of a skull. Uh, and uh, obviously an anthropologist will be able to go into greater detail and try to figure out if they can figure out exactly uh, why and how Brian Laundry died. Uh, the latest I've heard from investigators is at this point, they are confident they will likely at some point get a cause of death. Ruta Bay. You spoke with police today as well. What did they tell you? Yeah, some new interesting information. Uh, first of all, they said that the, uh, the notebook that was found, you remember there was a notebook of Brian Laundrie's found near his remains. They believe that while that notebook was wet, uh, that it will eventually be salvageable, uh, which could obviously be very, very crucial to learning more about exactly what happened if he perhaps wrote something in that notebook uh, before he died. Also, uh, we asked them about the question that so many people have uh, about the, the laundry showing up to the reserve early in the morning a couple of days ago uh, and within less than an hour finding Brian Laundry's personal items which actually led to the remains being found. We asked police if, police if they thought that was odd after the police had been there for so long searching on their own. Take a listen. This case from the onset has been odd. We've said odd over and over again. So it almost seems par for the course in this, unfortunately. Um, I think it is a coincidence. That's my belief uh, wholeheartedly. Okay, so police saying they do think it's a coincidence that the laundries were able to find uh, Brian's personal items so quickly, less than an hour after they got to the reserve. I asked police if the laundries are now under investigation. Uh, they said that would be a question for the FBI. Ruta Bay. Brian Etten in Florida for us. Thank you. And joining me now for more on the process of moving forward, retired FBI Special Agent Kenneth Gray. Welcome to the show. I want to start with a case like this. Can there ever really be justice? 
Hey, that's an excellent question. I mean, after all, the person who is potentially responsible for it, Brian Laundrie, is dead. You can't indict a dead person, at least uh, you can't indict a person that you know is dead. And so as far as the criminal justice system is concerned, there won't be any uh, justice for uh, the Petito family uh, because uh, uh, Brian Laundry is dead. Um, there are now two unsolved death investigations, as far as we know. How will the investigation into Gabby's death continue now? So uh, from the uh, beginning all the way to at this point, there's only been one person that has been named as a person of interest. Person of interest, by the way, has no real legal status, but uh, Brian Laundry is the person that they've been looking at. There are outstanding leads, I am sure, in Wyoming, and those leads have to be completed. I mean, the possibility that someone else might have been responsible, uh, any information along those lines have to be run down. But for the most part, the investigation in the um, in Wyoming is pretty much over. It's now totally focused on Brian Laundry. He had never been indicted for this for murder, uh, and so uh, you know that that's something to think about uh, in this case. Is that the the timing just was not there? Because I'm sure he would have been named uh, if there was just a little bit more time. Um, Quickly, Please I want to get this in. With thousands of other missing persons cases and unsolved homicides around this country, how much longer will law enforcement spend devoting such heavy resources to this particular case? I think this case is all but over. Like I said, Wyoming, there's a few leads that have to be uh, cleared up uh, down there uh, in Sarasota. The, the location there where Brian was found, they'll be searching that for uh, additional uh, possessions of Ryan, and they'll also be doing a uh, cause of death for him. But this case, in reality, is all but over. Uh, I, I'd say within a week, it should be completely clear if my guess is right. All right, Special Agent Gray, we appreciate your time tonight. We have to leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. On Balance with Leland Bittert stops at the top of the hour. He joins us now. What are you working on tonight? Well, you guys were talking about COVID vaccines, immunity, and the like. We're going to talk about the most vaccinated state in America, which is also the state with the highest number of COVID cases right now, where COVID is getting the worst. Dig in a little bit to what's happening in Vermont right now. And the flip side of that, which is amazing, is Vermont is only one of the four states where things are getting bad. The great news is the other 46 states in America, things are getting a lot better. I was wondering if you were going to give away which state it was, Vermont. You know, it's Friday. I'm being <laughs> generous here. The Donlin Report viewers I was deserve curious. that. But the, the why is the interesting part. Why is the vaccinated state have the highest number of cases? And secondly, we'll di dive into whether or not, as we continue through the pandemic, case numbers and positive cases of COVID is really what we should be paying attention to or if it's hospitalizations and deaths. All right, Leland Bitter, thank you. Join us at the top of the hour. And coming up, one gas pump in Central California is seeing a jump in gas prices, and it's a big one. Where is it and how much drivers there are paying? That's next. In tonight's American Snapshot, California is used to seeing high gas prices, but this is a whole new level even for the Central Coast. Right now, the national average for a gallon of regular gas is 337, but in the small beach town of Gorda, with the nearest gas station more than 40 miles away, drivers are now paying 759 a gallon. And that's just for regular unleaded gas. Premium is 850. That's nearly twice as high as the national average recorded at 411 back on July 17, 2008. And that was at the height of the Great Recession. California may be the golden state, but not when it comes to filling your tank in this town. And that's going to do it for the Donlin Report. I'm Rudy Bey Shabazi. On Balance with Leland Vitter is next.